Hey guys, Tom Moran here, about to do one that's going to be, a, I hope, a special one and one I'm really excited to do. And I actually started it last year and I'm glad I didn't finish it because I have a lot more to add to it. But this is basically going to be a retrospective on my M. Balfouri Communal. Now, for those of you who watch my channel, you know that I started an M. Balfouri Communal about two years ago. And my whole goal when I started it was to kind of chronicle the entire process from start to finish, from picking the enclosure, to the rehousings, to all the little things we caught in between as far as social interactions, molting, eating, feeding, the spider piles, which everybody seems to appreciate. My goal with the whole thing was to answer some questions for folks who were kind of afraid to pull the trigger and start one of these. It's no secret that at least here in the States, the M. Balfouri slings are still carry a fairly hefty price tag. And it can be kind of scary for somebody to drop down 50, 60 bucks on a bunch of slings, drop them in together with the thought in the back of their mind that they're probably going to turn into the Hunger Games and eat each other. So my hopes with this project was to A, see it all for myself. And I'm not by any stretch of the imagination the first person to try this. I want to make that very, very clear. However, I did find that a lot of people started one. It didn't quite chronicle it the way I wanted to see it. I wanted more information. I wanted a month by month play by play on these guys. And that's what I tried to do. So I originally posted some stuff on my website, but more importantly, I tried to catch video each month in that first year of what they were doing and how they were getting about to kind of set people's mind at ease. It, amazing, amazing stuff all around as far as I'm concerned. And some of the things I caught, I've still, I've watched repeatedly just because you don't expect spiders to socialize. And if you watch these guys and you've watched my videos, you see these guys do actually socialize. I mean, there's no other way to put it. They like being around each other. And I'm sorry, that's something, it's very evident when you watch them. So unfortunately, a lot of people now, or fortunately, are a lot of people now are starting to get into keeping Balfouri communals. And I get a lot of questions about them. And I have a lot of videos on them. And I know it can be a rather daunting task to go through the entire collection of videos. So what I've done here is kind of call through some of the best moments over the course of the last two years. That took quite a while and put together a narrative of how this whole project went down, what I observed, what types of uh, observations I was able to make about how to keep them and what one might expect. I also tried to work in some of the information I've got talking to other folks over the years who have started to keep or have kept M. Balfouri communals to fill in some of the blanks. So hopefully... For those of you who have not seen all the videos, this is a very accessible way to kind of go through and see the whole thing from start to finish. For those of you who have, I think this will be a fun review, and I know a lot of y'all joined my channel after finding the M. Balfouri communal videos, which is great, so this is kind of a nice way to relive it. There is a neat little new thing right at the end, but most of it's all reliving stuff that happened in the past. And then for people looking to start one out, and have questions, hopefully this video can start as a springboard to answer a lot of those questions so you know how to set them up, what size enclosures to look for, when you might have to rehouse, and what are some of the fascinating interactions you have to look forward to. So hopefully that covers it. I'm doing this without notes, obviously, which is probably not a good idea. I'm going to miss something, but that's why it's wonderful my editing program allows me to put little notes underneath because those are all the things I forget. So I'd say I'm going to stop talking, but I'm about to do about 40 minutes of talking over this video. Hopefully you guys appreciate it, and we'll catch you back at the end. Before starting off, I had a few questions that I wanted to answer, was hoping to answer through this communal setup. First off, I was wondering if they would end up in the same burrow, or were they scattered to different burrows? Would they eat together, and would they eat together peaceably? That was a huge concern, I think a huge concern for a lot of people. Were there any behavioral differences between M. Balfouris kept separately or those kept in a communal environment? Would they grow more quickly in the communal environment? And the big one would mature males if there were any pose a problem. So to start off, here we have the original setup and enclosure. This one I had custom made. Unfortunately, the place I had that made them went out of business. They, uh, well, for lack of a better term, screwed a bunch of people over and took off. But here was the original enclosure, which was a custom made 8 by 8 by 12. If you'll see, there are vents in the sides there, those black vents. Unfortunately, I thought that they might be too large 
large, the hole is too large and might permit an escape. So what I did was cut up some screening and use hot glue to put it over so they couldn't get out. It was a locking enclosure. It's a shame these guys weren't able to keep their acts together because these were really, this was a stunning enclosure. Unfortunately, it did have a blowout in the corner where the where it was supposed to be fused together it didn't work. But here you'll see how I have this set up with multiple hides. There was a cork bark with some fake leaves, some sphagnum moss. The substrate, there are questions about whether or not these guys need to be started on moist substrate. The bottom layers of this, probably the first two inches, was actually moist substrate. But up top it was all dry and I did let it completely dry out. And they did fine. Now granted, I got these guys in the summer, in July, when it was a bit more humid around here, so that could be part of it. And one thing you want to keep track of is your humidity inside your home or outside where you are. So keep that in mind. But you can see that the bottom probably two inches or so is moist but winter time came and our heater kicked on and the air got very dry and I did not bother re-moistening it I kept a water dish and what I would do eventually is sprinkle some water on the webbing which obviously no webbing yet because no spiders in here but I did give them the opportunity if you'll see there are three main burrows there underneath the cork bark and some starter burrows that I created using the back of a paintbrush and I did give them several places to go and what you'll notice in a moment when we do the rehousing, and there I am in the reflection, never noticed that before, is that they will kind of scramble to the different whatever hide is closest so that was the enclosure I would encourage anybody that this is you know looking at nine or so to look at something in this dimension because they will outgrow it quickly so here we go I received nine slings from Tanya at Fear Not Tarantula there were about between I would say a half inch to three quarters of an inch and one of them you'll notice in a moment actually molted in transit that was the biggest one but they started off rather tiny and you'll see when I put them in this new enclosure they look like they're swimming in it and there was some concern with the original audio here you could hear me actually remark to Billy about the fact that I was really worried that I was going to give them too much space because one of the things people bring up with communals is that you have to sometimes for certain species and I'm thinking like HNC or um, H gigas you have to kind of create an environment where they're crammed together so that they are forced to live together and they don't create their own territories what will happen with some of these we'll call them not true communal species is that if given enough room they will settle at opposite ends of the enclosure create kind of their own territories and then when they encounter each other it's not hey this is a roommate it's this is a rival spider or food so there I have a lot of people and you can see that these guys are teeny tiny in that enclosure absolutely like tiny little slings but you'll see eventually with these guys they will gravitate to the same burrows it doesn't matter but with other species that is a huge concern and I get a lot of people that ask me do I have to give them a super small cramped enclosure I know a youtuber out there put them in something very small because he was concerned they would create their own territories and eat each other I have not found that this is an issue with this species and I have since heard from many 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 people that have been keeping them communally it's nice because a lot of people are giving this a shot now and they have started them in larger enclosures and they have noticed the same thing I did that they will eventually all gravitate to the same burrow they want to be by each other and you'll see many instances of this throughout this video and I think this is probably the most remarkable part about keeping this species is the fact that they do want to be with each other they aren't like other species that you have to force them in close proximity they will put themselves in close proximity of each other and personally I think this is very important to note because people starting these guys off in very cramped quarters are just gonna have to do more rehousings that's that's a fact because they will grow very quickly and we'll get into that as the video goes on so I think giving them some space to begin with I have a lot of people that start them with five or six with five or six you want to give them something at least ten by six by six or so would be my estimate again anywhere around there would be fine if you want to start a little smaller that's okay if you want to start a little larger not a big deal I could have easily have started six of them in this enclosure and I probably would have gotten another couple months out of it maybe before I had to rehouse it took about a year as it was but I think that this is a species don't worry about cramping them together that would be my advice give them some space give them some room to grow allow them to go and do the webbing and create their enclosure the way they like it and give you some breathing room as far as when you have to rehouse them because it can be stressful rehousing multiple old world species tarantulas 
So here's an update about a month later, and you can see they put on quite a bit of size. This blew my mind a bit because my first set of Balfour A took forever to grow. I got them about an inch and a quarter, and these guys put on amazing size. They were eating great at this point. I was feeding them pre-killed. I would basically drop in a cricket and rip it in half and leave it in front of the burrow where that little guy is scrambling in. I also dropped in some live uh, pinhead red runners. They didn't seem to go at them. They, uh, the red runners were basically living, coexisting with them in there for quite a while. They would hide around the water dish and nobody seemed to be getting picked off. It took quite some time before they started picking them off. But basically what I would do is throw in some red runners, I'd throw in about 10 or so, and again, didn't notice anybody getting grabbed. And then I would take a cricket, rip it in half, put it in front of the enclosure, and they would go and scavenge feed on the cricket. They were excellent scavenge feeders of this size. And one of the reasons I did the pre-killed is because if you notice, if you've ever seen footage of the mothers taking care of them, and the mothers are incredible mothers with this species, they would kill a cricket, lay it down, and then the babies would come feed on it. So they seem to be much more adaptable to doing eating that way at first and didn't seem to pay much attention to the live prey, which is something I found very, very fascinating. And coming up, we get to see them feeding. There is a dead cricket right there, and sorry for the footage. I try not to disturb them because they'd scramble up, but that is a large cricket that I basically ripped apart, and there's three of them feeding on it. These group feedings blew my mind, and I think are one of the coolest aspects of keeping these species. When they're smaller, they will all group feed on the same prey item and again I think that points to how they've adapted to live in the wild because the mothers have been observed in collections that you keep the slings with them killing food items dropping them down and letting the babies come and feed on them that is something you normally don't see with tarantulas I think it's incredibly fascinating and one of the reasons why keeping these guys is so darn rewarding but there you can see three of them there is no friction whatsoever I think that was my biggest fear and a lot of people I talked to their biggest fear is that one of them will mistake another one for a food item, and that just doesn't happen. They basically will touch each other when they approach with their front legs, even when they're in kind of feeding mode, and feel each other out and realize, all right, this is, for quote, the lack of a better term, my buddy, I'm not going to eat him, but I'm going to eat this prey item that's right underneath them. So they do seem to recognize each other and use touch in their legs to ID each other as friendly as opposed to running and jumping on each other and trying to eat each other. So I thought that was amazing. And again, you'll see the three there came all out of that webbed burrow behind them. They were all in the same burrow now, gravitated to the same place. And here's a better shot of a group feeding with a bunch of them on the same prey item. You can see them all there. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them, maybe eight, I believe. And this is one of the few times I was catching all eight of them out. That tends to be a big concern with folks that are keeping these. You uh, Be warned, you often won't catch all of them out at once. There always seems to be one guy or gal that hides down in the tunnels while the other ones are up doing their thing. So that's something I had to get used to. It kind of freaked me out a bit at first. Now I'm fine with it. But Billy and I would be in this room obsessively every time we do a feeding counting all of them trying to find nine and for quite a while all we were able to find was eight and we we're kind of freaking out a bit we were worried that one of them might have died or possibly there was some cannibalism but that was never never proven to be the case eventually if you if you're patient enough you will catch all of them out and again obviously things can die i know petco from dark den had one of his disappear Who's to say if it got eaten or if it just died? I would guess it probably just died because I haven't seen any indication that they will cannibalize as long as they are well fed. So most likely it was just a sickly sling that passed on. So something to keep in mind, don't worry when you don't see them all out in the open. A lot of times there will be one that will hide underneath. So here you can see there is, again, no fighting over food. They are totally getting along. And what would happen when you give them a larger prey item sometimes, which is really neat to see, is that they would two of them or more would approach one item. And instead of fighting over it, you can see the one there has got some of its mouth. They would rip a piece off and then kind of walk away and eat on their own, which I thought was very cool. So they'd approach when they were little. They would all just basically sit there on the same prey item, eating off of it. Once they got a little bit larger, this changed, and they would move off. They would grab a piece, move off, and eat on their own.
Now, we all know that most tarantulas are cannibals, so it kind of freaks us out having some together, and we're always worried about cannibalism. But as I stated earlier, I don't think it's particularly a huge risk with this species, and most of the people I've spoken to have had no issues with it. Just make sure you get them on a good feeding schedule when they're younger. For the slings, I was feeding them twice a week with the pre-killed. And again, you don't have to go crazy. I've heard some people freaking out about them preying on each other because I know other species like HNC, you got to really make sure, and NC now, you got to really make sure you pump the food to them or they will start picking each other off. These guys, I don't think they do it. I'd almost guess that you could keep them from getting food for quite some time and they still wouldn't resort to cannibalism. Not that I'm going to try this one out. But again, twice a week is good. You don't have to go crazy. And there you can see one of the little live roaches coming up to investigate. That was the funny thing is some of the little live roaches at this point would come up and feed off of the dead crickets, which was kind of nasty, and the spiders wouldn't pay them any attention. So at this size, while they're scavenge feeding, kill a couple bigger prey items, depending on how many you have. With five, a lot of people are doing five, I'd put one or two dead large crickets in there. If you have more than that, maybe a couple more, let them scavenge feed, and then every few days is enough. I slowed down the schedule a bit when they hit their young adult size, when they're like two and a half, three inches or so, and then I'd go to once a week. But twice a week is perfectly fine. And coming up, we're going to have what was the August update. Now, mind you, I have only had these slings for about three months here. Look at the size of them. They are putting on incredible amount of size, especially compared to the ones I raise separately. So I would say that the growth rate, in my opinion, was much faster than those M. Balfouris. I had three of them. It was two mature males. It ended up being a female, two males and a female, that ended up growing very, very slowly overall. These guys were picking picking up a lot of size. They were eating great, much better than the ones kept separately. They were out a lot more, which was fantastic, and they were putting on a lot more size. You can see here, these guys are only, this is only three months after they were originally put into this enclosure. You can also notice that they are webbing the snot out of this. That, that was one cool thing I enjoyed watching and unfortunately didn't catch a lot of footage of, but they would come out and web together. So you'd see two or three of them working on a corner and they'd all be webbing up at the same time almost like in tandem like they were working together to create their surroundings which I thought was incredibly interesting so you can see here that these guys are getting to that juvenile stage or starting to, starting to show a little coloration in the legs they are much less solitary and shy, I found, when kept together. And I think that was the biggest difference in behavior. The other ones that I picked up, I got about this size, and I rarely saw them. They had burrowed a bit, webbed up a lot around the burrow, and you would rarely catch them. I remember I finally caught a feeding video after I'd kept one for like over a year, and I was so excited to actually kept, uh, catch it out. So that is something I've noticed as far as temperament and behavior. They seem to be a lot less shy. And you'll catch a lot of them hanging out and about, especially in the warm summer months. And here they are in September, obviously quite large and full juveniles. I was shocked at how quickly these guys put on size. Um, after raising my other three that took years to get to adulthood, to watch these guys go from half inch to three quarter inch slings to inch and three quarter, two inch juveniles was just amazing. I, could, I couldn't figure it out. I, I never anticipated they would grow that quickly. So here's one of them out and about. And again, once again, a lot less shy overall. And now we're going to jump forward a couple months to December. And as you can see, they're almost starting to look like little adults. And December was a huge month because by this point, they were full bore eating live prey. Before this, I was still kind of dropping in some dead stuff. But right about, I would say November, December is when they really started hunting prey, the norm, normal size prey for a spider that size. I would basically, and there goes one shooting around, I would basically drop in. Uh, 10 to 12 medium-sized crickets or even close to large crickets and they would hunt them down no problem. So there's a couple hanging in the corner there. So that was a huge landmark. So don't be surprised if you guys eat the dead prey longer than some other species. And I will admit that I didn't try offering live prey for quite some time because the first couple times I did it, they didn't eat. So I just kept dropping in dead prey. Had I offered it earlier, it, they might have taken it. But it took a, a few months for them to start taking the normal sized live prey that I would feed to spiders this size. And there you can see them all cuddling together. There's one of them, I believe, that is just molted and pulled out of its molt. 
And one thing people tend to worry about is dropping in the live crickets and worrying about the crickets feasting on one that might be molting. That has not been a problem. Keep in mind, they're not all generally going to molt at the same uh, time. So if one of them is molting, the rest of them are on the prowl for crickets and food. So I don't think the crickets are able to really do any damage. There's never been an issue. And here we are in January with some of them eating. And as you can see, now they are actually sporting those adult colors. You can see the tan, some of the blue showing up legs. There's one of them feasting on a nice fat cricket. In this video, you can also see the amount of webbing. And there's a young female. You can see that pearl-esque blue carapace and the blue on the legs. Look, you know, basically sporting her adult colors. But the amount of webbing these guys produce is amazing, especially in the smaller enclosure. Uh, had I moved them earlier, they probably wouldn't have as much. But I really was reluctant to rehouse them only because I was just amazed at the amount of web they produce. You can see the entire goes all the way up to the top of the enclosure. It actually started to make it a little bit difficult to open, and that's when I realized that we're getting to the point where I was going to have to rehouse. But I hated to destroy all that work. That is some of the most beautiful things webbing I've ever seen out of anything and of course if you've got you know eight or nine spiders working on it that's what you're gonna get and this video here represents one of the first times I caught all nine of them out although you can't see them all here it's kind of tough to discern where they are Billy and I were able to count all nine which is good because for a couple months we had only ever seen eight and we're freaking out so again don't be surprised if one of them plays hard to get and you don't see it much and also keep in mind they're very difficult to tell apart so it might not be the same one you're not seeing and here's some more of them up and about you can see this is where I realized that we're starting to outgrow the enclosure because we're spending a lot of time up high on that webbing which made it a little tricky sometimes to open the enclosure without having Balfouris bolt everywhere. But the good news was they wouldn't bolt out of the enclosure. And here's one. There we go. One of the only times I actually catch one, I caught one hunting. I love that one. But yeah, keep in mind that they want to be by each other and this is their home. So the good news is if you tap that enclosure before you open it up, most of them will go disappearing into the web. They're not going to stand their ground. They're not going to try to bolt out. They're going to go into one of those tunnels. You can see it almost looks like Swiss cheese there. They're going to go into one of those holes or those tunnels and disappear beneath the surface. So just when you're doing them, if you have something like this similarly happen where they web up all the way to the top, be smart about it. Take the enclosure out. Usually I would take mine out and put it on my dinner table, which would be more than enough warning to them that something was going to happen and that enclosure was going to open. And then by the time I would get the enclosure, even when it was tearing out a little bit of web, they were generally calm and hidden. And as you can see here, this one here has its little cricket, its little trophy, and the one over there really isn't doing anything. I have caught them, and we'll see some footage coming up later on, stealing food from each other, but they really don't fight over it. And here we go. This is March where they are basically young adults. There it is. That looks like an adult Balfouri. So it didn't take many months at all. We're still well under a year here. And there's another one. You can see the blue legs. There's some up there. They're already looking like full-blown adults. If I didn't tell you these guys are only about two and three quarter, three inches or so, you could be easily fooled into thinking it was a bunch of full-grown female Balfouris. But we're not done yet because one of them is going to uh, molt into a male. We'll get to that in a moment. But do they they grow faster when kept together in my opinion yes they absolutely do without a doubt these guys easily lap the first three I kept alone and here's one little girl right there looking very pretty doing a little happy dance after getting a cricket just amazingly gorgeous seeing all of these guys basically looking like full-grown adults in this enclosure in less than a year after I put them in here and in June of 2016, almost exactly a year after I first acquired them, it was time to rehouse. Here are some of the things I picked up to set up this enclosure as it was going to be the centerpiece of my collection. I decided to go all out. So what we have here is some vines, some cork bark. I picked up this resin sculpture there, which I thought would be really nice to kind of put as the centerpiece and give them something to web to. It was a little bit heavy, but what I did was basically fill that hole in the bottom. I glued something over it so they couldn't get into it. I didn't want them inside of it and then I was going to use some of the plastic wood right there one of those and basically glue them to the bottom to make supports and then plant it in the dirt and it worked great it didn't move at all it stayed exactly where I want it and of course we have the cork bark 
Molly getting into the picture and we basically use the cork bark in this to create kind of the centerpiece sculpture of it and plus the burrow. These here were also really good. I could use them to glue them onto the sculpture to make some kind of like windy vines and stuff for them to web to and hide under and it worked great because they created their burrows out of those. So those worked out great and then of course we have the cork bark that I had to clean up a little bit because I picked it up wholesale and it had some webbing on it from you can tell this stuff was straight out of the wild so we had to get that stuff out of it so make sure you clean up your cork bark before you use it. But we use this also to create some burrows artificial burrows to start it off and it worked like fantastically and now they've all webbed the whole thing up and you can't even tell what half of this stuff is anymore. So this is what I use in the inside. The enclosure itself I got from Lorex Plastics. I had it custom made because I wanted drilled ventilation holes as opposed to uh, vents with wire vents and it was beautifully done. You can see there just a beautiful enclosure. This one is 11 inches by 11 inches by two feet which proved to be a great size for the size of the communal I was rehousing. And for substrate in this one, I ended up using a mix of dried cocoa fiber. I rehydrated it and then baked it in the oven to dry it out with a little bit of vermiculite and some sphagnum moss. But that's about it. I switched it up a little bit for this one because I knew I was going to have to move this enclosure and it couldn't be, the topsoil would have made it way too heavy. So I used the cocoa fiber because of the fact it is a bit more light and fluffy. And I think that was a good call because the thing is still pretty heavy. And finally, it was time to do the actual rehouse. You'll see what I did here is put the old enclosure in a large box to give myself some extra space to work and give them some extra obstacles should one shoot out of this enclosure. I didn't want it to end up on the dinner table. So this usually what will happen is if something escapes, they get into a corner and they kind of hide there and you can usually cup them. But what I did was make several cups using water bottles that are seltzer water bottles that I cut the bottoms off of and then put holes in the side, use those as the catch cups. And what I was able to do was get several of them in the same bottle and then move the bottle over to the new enclosure and prod them out. It worked very, very well. So we kind of stressed about this for quite some time. And I think for most people that decide to keep an M Balfour communal, this is going to be the most stressful moment for you. Most of it will be fun just sitting back and watching them, but trying to rehouse them, they will burrow a bit. They web up the whole top of the enclosure, which can make it tough. They will burrow beneath the webbing and beneath the ornaments. And you can see a couple of them going out there and trying to find out where they all are and keep track of them while you're moving one can be a bit daunting. I, but I will say, if you notice, nobody's throwing up a threat posture. They bolt a little bit, but they don't want to go too far from their homes. And I think that's because, again, with these communal guys, this is this is their refuge. This is where they feel safe. They want to be in that old burrow with the rest of their sack mates. They don't want to be out and about. So I think if you use that to your advantage, if you watch other M. Balfour rehousing videos for the most part they cooperate very very well and you can see what I do is get a couple of them in these place them in the new enclosure and then later on I would prod them out so all in all it only took about 20 minutes to get all eight of them out it might even been less than that I had no issues not a single threat posture not a single escape and everybody moved into the new enclosure fairly well but the trick is try to get as much as the stuff out of the way the ornaments the water dishes whatever as possible ahead of time so you're not navigating around them because as you can see, well, this one goes right up in. This is a good example, but some of them will bolt right underneath that webbing and try to hide. And with all the old molts and everything else that you're going to have in there, it can be quite tricky trying to figure out what's an old molt and what's a spider. And right there, I believe I have two or three in that. I think there's three in this one here. Here we go. One more. And there we go. And that was three. So that's pretty much how the whole rehousing went. Very, very well. No, ins uh, no issues. Billy was a fantastic help out in the spot, and they adapted to their new homes rather nicely and quickly. And now we skip a couple months, and it's September, and there they are, some of them hanging out, looking like, again, little adults. They've done a bit of webbing. You can see underneath the sculpture there, they've got some web tunnels, and underneath that piece of cork bark, and there's a few of them sitting out in a cricket that is praying that nobody notices them. And... In a moment, I think we'll get to see a little bit of the interaction from two of them. The one there, that one right there has a cricket in its mouth. And I was very fortunate to catch some of the actual physical interactions between these guys because they are spectacular. You can see the one coming out of the tunnel here. 
This is what I was talking about earlier with them using their legs to kind of touch each other. I have a funny feeling that one in the tunnel kind of wants that cricket, but the other one's kind of pushing it away like, uh, 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 that's mine. And these, unfortunately, I've caught several of them before this, but sometimes I'm sitting there so slack-jawed and, and in awe that I forgot to pick up my camera, which stinks because that's it would be beautiful stuff for my YouTube channel. But there we go. You can see that's exactly what I was talking about early. Sometimes they do it with their front legs, but here we have one of them using its back legs to kind of say back off and the other one kind of trying to feel it out. So something you don't get to see with other species of tarantulas. If only that one would go ahead and look to its left, there's a cricket sitting right there, but it's not. But those are some of the physical and we'll, I'll even call them social interactions that you can see when you keep a Balfouri communal. Those are the moments where you realize that what you have is something special, especially if you've been in the hobby for a while and kept tarantulas separately to see them socialize it blows the mind. It doesn't get old. And I caught them the other day doing some socialization and kind of touching each other. And then they basically cuddled. It was amazing. You just don't see that with anything else. And I think that's something that most people are going to appreciate the most once their little guys put on some size. And here we go. This is October of 2017. My first mature male. Um, in a way, it was amazing because I've to know that I grew this guy all the way up from one of those teeny tiny slings is, is very satisfying. But it was also sad because that was kind of the end of an era as far as I was concerned. As far as these little slings, they were turning into adults now. And there was the proof, a mature male ready to breed. Now, one of the questions was, would the males upset the communal? I've heard that they can kind of throw off the quote-unquote energy of a communal. It didn't happen with this guy. He'd go around, he'd kind of paw at some of the females, and they'd have some weird things where they almost looked like they were trying to mate with each other. He, he and another female, or possibly a male, we'll get to that at the very end of this video, but there was nothing doing. They weren't obviously going to mate because they didn't have the right equipment at the time, and the male basically would just wander around, and the females would kind of dust and brush him off like, yeah, I don't want any part of this, and he'd wander away. So there was no real friction. He does get paired with my large female. We'll get to that in a bit, but it didn't really upset the communal at all. And here we are in October with my young adults now, and there's one eating, I believe, a couple crickets. They turn into quite little pigs when you get larger. So keep in mind, if you are keeping these guys, I've seen ones grab up three crickets at a time. So if I have, like in this case, I have nine Balfouri in there, I will drop in like 14 or so crickets, give them a couple extra, and there's one in the water dish that I pull out later. And what will happen is some of them will grab up more than one, some will only get one, and then some of the crickets, oh, there's a good grab. Some of the crickets will be left around for later, but they won't be there for long, trust me. Usually two or three days after a feeding, there is nothing alive left in that tank. And for this one, what I wanted to do is, there we go, is grab again, is catch some of the hunting behavior, and then we caught something really cool here. That one tries to go in a tunnel, but there's another one in the tunnel there. There we go. So they back up, it kind of gets in the tunnel, and then decides, no, I'm not going to go. So it goes up top here, and in a moment, we're going to catch some of the best footage I think I've caught of these guys as far as any type of friction that comes around eating time. More often than not, there aren't any issues whatsoever, but as you'll see, this one is going to climb up, and what you can't see is to the left, there is another one hiding behind the sculpture that has noticed as a cricket, and bam. Now, this may look scary, but if you notice, all it did was tackle it and take the cricket out of its mouth. So the one on the bottom is like, aw, and now it's going to go check that hole again. The one on top just stole its cricket. So kind of some like nasty catty behavior from them, but nobody was injured in that. And I think that is incredibly important to note because although they did have a little tussle over the food, the one that, that was quote unquote attacked was able to get away safe and sound. So there you can see one eating, another one hanging out of the hole. And that is the only time I've caught a tussle that there's one right here. Yep. That one just grabbed a cricket from that one. So they will steal food from each other. I have had people tell me they have seen them give the other ones food. I haven't seen that one yet myself. And I kept this video in because although we talk about M. balfouri being an arid species, they like it dry, they do very well with it dry, they will drink, which is why I always tell people to include water dishes. There you can see the one over there to the right 
taking a nice long drink of water. I have caught these guys drinking quite a few times, and I think that's important to note that the arid species, even the ones that like to be kept dry, will appreciate access to water. I've talked many times about the importance of including water dishes with all species of tarantulas, but I particularly noticed that species like my G. porteri, my Green Bottle Blue, and my M. balfouris, ones that are kept all dry, are ones I catch drinking more than any other. So that's important to know. And there it is, taking a nice long guzzle. So we're leaving that one in there. Before somebody asks, yes, include a water dish. You saw that I even had that little water dish in there for the tiny little slings and they did just fine nobody drowned everybody was better off for it and here is some amazing social footage i was able to catch you can see the one to the right there is the mature male and everybody's just kind of hanging out and about and you can see the two what i think are females to the left with their legs entangled and again don't be surprised to catch your guys in very close proximity to each other or even purposely touching each other they joked i made up something called the spider pile earlier on where a bunch of them would kind of cuddle up together and you can see here watch the behavior between the male and the spider behind him this is really kind of odd and I think, again, this is a mature male, so he is looking for anything to breed at this point. And he would kind of approach the other ones. But this is what we talked about as far as them not upsetting the overall energy of the communal. They seem to give it a try. And then when the other one doesn't show any interest whatsoever here, it almost looks like that almost looks like breeding behavior where they're getting ready to go. And we'll see some breeding behavior in a moment. But when the other one wasn't interested, they just kind of touch legs a little bit and it wanders off. So that's it. The guy's like, oh, all right, never mind. She doesn't want anything that he's given. So there she goes moving on. He's going to go try with somebody else. And again, the other spiders in the communal didn't seem to be the least bit bothered by it. And he wasn't particularly insistent. And he was pretty low energy for a male. And here we have some incredibly interesting behavior as what appears to be two females, but it could be an immature male, I'm not sure, unfortunately it's tough to identify them, are having an interaction. Now the one from behind is going to start doing this weird tapping thing with her legs. Watch here. A stroking. And boom. Now, there was some discussion on whether or not this was courting. There it is again, courting behavior or possibly some type of dominance behavior, which I am inclined to think may be dominance, only because you can see they're not turning around, they're not, you know, entwining their legs like they would in a normal rating, mating ritual. And I've never seen other spiders kind of tap from behind like this, but it could be. Who knows? We're not sure. And again, a lot of this is speculation, but I had not caught this previously. And as you can see in a moment, this one is going to kind of climb over top of the other one and push it out of the way. But there was a lot of speculation when I posted this about what we could be seeing. And a lot of folks express the opinion that you don't see dominance behavior in insects or arachnids. But you would have to think that an arachnid that can live in a communal setup like this must have some type of social structure or hierarchy as, as far as who's in charge. You would think there would have to be something in there to avoid friction. So you can see this one climbed up. The one that was on the bottom is now moving away. So again, no fighting at all, but definite, definitely interesting behavior and stuff I'd love to see from other people if they do a Balfouri communal. And now she's just kind of walking away. And we spoke about the male. He did not die a virgin. We ended up hooking him up with my female adult that I had. It was one of the three I talked about that I raised previously. The pairing looked like it went great. He climbed into the enclosure. The first time I tried to pair him, she came out a little strong. I think she was actually going at him, and he got the heck out. Second pairing, which is the one you see here, it went very well. They sat like this for quite some time usually they the males do the insertion and then they boogie and then the females will either try to eat them or back off in this case they sat like this for quite some time but it did appear to be a successful pairing unfortunately my female molted out before she could lay a sack very disappointed about that one and this male is gone now unfortunately right before winter time he disappeared with the females into the burrows and I haven't seen him since I have a funny feeling he was looking kind of small before, so he probably passed. 
And here they are in May. This was my last update. And something to note with these guys, and I've heard this from quite a few people now, and I experienced it with both the communal setup and the ones I kept separately. When winter time comes and the heater kicks on and the temperature drops outside, it doesn't seem to matter what the temps are inside. They seem to recognize this and do a bit of for lack of a better term, hibernating. Now, basically, they will still continue to eat. You just won't catch them out as much. And I did talk to somebody over the winter that was really concerned because they had put five of them in and they hadn't seen more than one up on the surface at a time. And that appears to be a fairly normal behavior for them. My ones that were solo did it a lot longer than the ones that I kept in the communal setup. Those guys would basically bury themselves and you wouldn't see them at all. With the communal setup, you usually catch some feet or one of them out and about every once in a while, usually at feeding time. And your best bet if you want to catch them out is to come in the morning. That's why I have that red light on them sometimes because I can sneak down at night and catch them out. But in the winter, they become very, very reclusive. So that's normal behavior. Don't panic if you're seeing that. A couple other questions I get are, is, are you able to put in more than one sack? Do they have to be from the same sack if you start a communal? And with a lot of these so-called communal species, you do have to start with specimens from the same sack. That is not the case with these. I believe these guys were from two different sacks, and they did perfectly fine. I have since talked to many people, and this has been the best part about doing this, is it's not just my word anymore. A lot more people are trying them and emailing me with the results, and they've all been very, very positive for the most part. But a lot of people have dropped in slings from different sacks. I had one guy that ordered a couple from a, a dealer and then found some at a show and dropped them in together and they did perfectly fine. They're still doing perfectly fine. So they seem to recognize each other. Another question is, do they have to be the same size? Now, personally, I'd be a little worried about this, although I've I, honestly, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do perfectly fine. And I've heard from people that have told me they have dropped ones in from different sizes and been perfectly fine. I believe one instance, there were two juveniles and they dropped in a adult female with them and they were all doing great. They, she didn't attack the little juveniles, she didn't eat them, and they all ended up in the same burrow together. That's amazing to me. In another case, I believe it was a couple one-inch slings with a juvenile and again, there were no issues. So I just... I, it's, nothing should surprise me about these guys anymore. I've seen some amazing things while keeping them, but it's still one of those things that just nags at the back of your head. What if they you know, get a feeding response and prey on the smaller ones, but they don't seem to do that. So if anybody does go this route, I would absolutely love to hear about it because I will be doing an update on these guys eventually, and I could mention that, and it would be nice to set people's minds at ease that do find themselves with a couple different size spiders. Now, when speaking to other folks that have kept them communally, the one warning I did get from a couple different people was that dropping in a female, a mature female with other mature females can cause some issues. They can be a bit territorial then. From what I gathered, they don't necessarily attack and kill the female, but there will be some friction as she settles in. In one instance, I believe the person said she eventually settled in fine with the rest of them, and the other one I didn't hear back, so unfortunately I don't know how that turned out. So that's something to think about. And again, I think for the best chance at having a positive experience with these, it would make sense to start with smaller. I, I mean, personally, I'd encourage folks to start with slings or smaller specimens, or if you find larger specimens, ones that have already been kept with each other previously, why, you know, take the chance. But that's just my belief. Again, a lot of this, what we've learned about these guys has come from experimentation. So hopefully people continue to experiment with the communals in different situations with larger specimens, smaller, mature, whatever it may be. And of course, I can't resist getting pictures of them drinking so here's one drinking and these were the red lights i was talking about i would encourage folks to check out the led lights i picked these up on amazon and they're fantastic because you can see perfectly and beautifully when you come down in the morning to check on them and it, they don't register the red light so they don't scatter when the light is on they come right out like it's nighttime and do their thing so a great way to catch them out and about I get a lot of folks that ask about babies so far. There are none, and I believe that's because the males seem to have matured out before the females were ready, although that might change. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So far, there's nothing. I really wouldn't want to have a bunch of babies in here only because it'd be a, a terrible, it'd be difficult to get them all out because we couldn't keep them all in here. There'd be quite a few, but we'll see how it goes. I'm not going to lie. It'll be fascinating if it happens. It'll make for some great footage. So to be continued, we'll see where that goes. Finally, we got a shock the other day when after eight months after the first male 
matured we got another mature male this one is probably close to an inch bigger than that last mature male he's a big one and you can see him there i apologize for the quality of the footage every time i bumped the enclosure this guy would bolt but that was quite the shock because i assumed i had eight females left but unfortunately that may not be the case so now we're waiting to see who else molts out uh, male the one problem with these guys it is very difficult to sex them because you never know which molts belong to which spiders so you just kind of have to wait till they mature and see what you got all right that'll about do it that was a lot of fun to go through honestly i had several hours of footage i was able to pare down and it was difficult because, honestly, anything I've caught on these guys has been absolutely fascinating. I didn't want to leave it out. But we can only make it so long, and I don't want to try people's attention span. So anybody that's interested in checking out the other videos, you can go back. And I did create a playlist with all of the M. Balfouri videos in them. So you can watch the longer versions with my original commentary. And again, if you're planning on keeping one, it might be a good thing to do just to get an idea. Also, search up M. Balfouri communals now because a lot of folks out there have them. I know Eerie Arachnids has one. Petco, obviously, from Dark Den has one. My buddy Mark from Mark Tarantulas has one. I know I'm forgetting people. They're just Every time I turn around, somebody's getting one, which is great because now I think the information is getting out there. People feel safe in keeping them, which is, you know, honestly, the whole point of this is to kind of give people that reassurance that these guys are actually a communal species. Again, if I'd have one wish, it would be that somebody would observe this in the wild, because unfortunately, there's still people out there that believe or carry the idea that until we see them in the wild acting communally, we can't call them a true communal species. I understand that line of thinking to a point, but I think we've seen more than enough evidence that these guys do thrive when kept together, and I have a hard time believing in the very small time we've kept them in the hobby that they've just clicked on some type of trigger that allowed them to adapt to this type of behavior. I, this has to be something that they've had in the wild and now that this carrying forward in captivity. So anyway, thanks so much for taking the time to watch. If you enjoyed this video, I'm going to try to go ahead and put a link to the playlist here as well as another video here. And then if you like what you saw, please feel free to subscribe and click the button up there. As usual, thanks so much for watching. I think I said that already. I have a hard time with these endings and we'll catch you next time.